John Gill's Commentary of the Entire Bible Genesis Chapter 6 The Introduction to Genesis 6 This chapter gives an account of the wickedness of the old world both among the profane and the professors of religion, which was taken notice of and represented by God, upon which he determined the destruction of it. Genesis 6 1 Only one man, Noah, is accepted who found favor with God, and whose character is given, Genesis 6, 8, and to whom was observed by God the general corruption of the earth, Genesis six eleven, and to whom he gave orders and directions for the building an ark for himself and his family, being determined to destroy the earth with a flood and all the creatures in it, Genesis six fourteen. Only he would preserve him and his wife, his three sons and their wives, and two of every living creature, for which and for himself and his family. He was to take food into the ark when built, Genesis 6.18, and the chapter is concluded with observing that Noah did as he was commanded, Genesis chapter 6, verse 22. Genesis Chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, either mankind in general, or rather the prosperity of Cain, who were mere natural men, such as they were when born into the world, and as brought up in it, destitute of the grace of God, and of the knowledge and fear of Him, and who, in proportion, much more multiplied than the prosperity of Seth, because of the practice of polygamy, which by the example of Lamech, one of that race, might prevail among them. And daughters were born unto them, not daughters only, but sons also, though it may be more daughters than sons, or it may denote remarkable ones for the beauty or immodesty or both. And chiefly, this is observed for the sake of what follows. John Gill, Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, or good, not in a moral but natural sense, goodly to look upon, or a beautiful aspect, and they looked upon and only regarded their external beauty, and lusted after them. Those, quote, sons of God, unquote, were not angels either good or bad, as many have thought, since they were our incorporeal beings and cannot be affected with fleshly lust, or marry or be given in marriage, or generate or be regenerate, nor the sons of judges, magistrates, or great personage, nor they themselves as the targums of Oculos, that's O N K E L O S, and Jonathan. And so Jarki, J A R C H I, and Aben Ezra. But this could be no crime in them to look upon and take in marriage such persons, though they were the daughters of the meaner sort, and supposing they acted a criminal part in looking at them, and lusting after them, and committing fornication with them, and even in marrying irreligious persons, yet this could only be a partial not a universal corruption, just it is as it is after affirmed, though such examples must indeed have great influence upon the populace, but rather this is to be understood of the prosperity of Seth, who, from the times of Enos, when then, then began to be called by the name of the Lord, Genesis 4.25, had the title of the sons of God, in distinction with, from the children of men. These claim the privilege of divine adoption and profess to be born of God and partakers of His grace and pretended to worship Him according to His will, so far as revealed in them, and to fear and serve and glorify Him. According to the Arabic writers, immediately after the death of Adam, the family of Seth, was separated from the family of Cain. Seth took his sons and, and his, their wives to a high mountain, Hermon, on the top of which 
Adam was buried, and Cain and all his sons lived in the valley beneath, where Abel was slain, and they on the mountain obtained a name for holiness and purity, and were so near the angels that they could hear their voices and join their hymns with them, and they, their wives, and their children, went by the common name of the sons of God. And now these were adjourned by Seth and by succeeding patriarchs by no means go, to go down from the mountain and join the Canaanites. But notwithstanding in the times of Jared, some did go down, it seems. See Gil on Genesis chapter 5, verse 20. And after that, others. And at this time, it became general and being taken with the beauty of the daughters of Cain and his prosperity, they did as follows. And they took them wives of all that they chose, not by force, as Aben Ezra and Ben Gerasim, that's G E R S O M, interpret. For the Canaanites, being more numerous and powerful than they, it can hardly be thought that the one would attempt it or the other suffer it. But they intermarried with them, which the Canaanites might not be adverse unto. They took to them wives as they fancied, which were pleasing to the flesh without regard to the moral and civic character, and without the advice and consent of their parents, and without consulting God and his will in the matter. Or they took women as they pleased and were to their liking and committed fornication, to which the Canaanites were addicted, as they spent their time in singing and dancing and uncleanliness, whereby the prosperity of Seth or the sons of God were lured to come down and join them and commit fornication with them, as the Arabic writers relate. And of Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, by John Gill, Exposition of the Bible, had been read by Dr. Peter John. John Gill's Exposition of the Bible, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, not to Noah, as in Genesis 6.13. For as yet, he is not taken notice of, or any discourse addressed to him. But rather, to or within himself, he said what follows, or thus concluded, and resolved on in his own mind. My spirit shall not always strive with man meaning either the soul of man called the Spirit of God in Job 27, verse 3, because of his creation and is what he breathes and put into men and therefore is styled the Father of Spirits, and which is in man, as some in Aben Ezra observed to be the sense the word used as a sword and a scalpel. And so the meaning is, it shall not always abide there, but be unsheathed and drawn out. Man should not live always, since he is corrupt and given to carnal lust, or else, as Jarkin thinks, God himself is meant, and that the sense is, my spirit shall not always contend within myself, or there shall not always be contention within me concerning man, whether I shall destroy him or have mercy on him. I am at a point to punish him, since he is wholly carnal, or rather this is to be understood of the Holy Spirit of God as the Targum of Jonathan, which agrees with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, and to be thus interpreted, that the Spirit of God, which had been litigating and reasoning the point, as men do in a court of justice, as the word signifies, with these men in the court and at the bar of their own consciences, by one providence or by one minister or another, particularly by Noah, a preacher of righteousness, in vain and to no purpose. Therefore he determines to proceed, no longer in this way, but pass and execute the sentence of condemnation on them. For this he also is flesh, not only carnal and corrupt, but sadly corrupted, and wholly given up to and immersed in sensual lust and carnal pleasures, so as not to be restrained nor reformed, even the prosperity of Seth, professors of religion also, as well as the profane world and prosperity of Cain. Yet his days shall be 120 years. 
meaning not the term of man's life. Reduce this from the length of time he lived before the flood, but this designs the space that God would give for repentancy before he proceeded to execute his vengeance on him. This is that long-suffering of God the Apostle speaks of in the forementioned place that waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. And so both the Targums of On Kelos, that's O-N-K-E-L-O-S, and Jonathan interpreted of a space of 120 years, given them to repent. Now, whereas it was but a hundred years from the birth of Japheth to the flood. Some think the space was shortened 20 years because of their impendency, but it was more probable that Jarki observes that this decree was made and given out 20 years before his birth, though here related by a figure called Hysterion Protoon, Frequence in the Scriptures. John Gill, Exposition of the Bible, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. The, there were giants in the earth in those days, that is, in the days before the sons of God took the daughters of men for wives, in such a general number as before declared, and before the dissension and apostasy became so universal, even in the times of Jared, as the Arabic writers understand it, who say that these giants were begotten on the daughters of Cain by the children of Seth, who went down from the mountain to them in the days of Jared, that's J-A-R-E-D, see Genesis 5.20, the word uh, nephim, that's nephim, that's N-E-P-H-I-L-I-M, comes from a word which signifies to fall, and these might be so called, either because they made their fear to fall upon men, or men through fear to fall before them because of their height and strength, or rather because they fell and rushed on men with great violence and oppressed them in a cruel and tyrannical manner, or as some think, because they fell and were apostatized from the true religion, which is much better than to understand them of apostate angels, whom the Targum of Jonathan mentions by name and calls them. S-C-H-A-N-C-H-A-Z-A-I and Azel, who fell from heaven and were in the earth in those days. And also after that, which shows that the preceding clause respects giants in former times. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, came into their houses and chambers and laid with them, and they bare children unto them, or giants unto them, as may be supplied from the former clause, for the sense is, as there were giants before this general defection, so there were at this time when there was a mixture of the Canaanites and the Sethites, which were the offspring of the sons of God, or the prosperity of Seth, mixing with the daughters of men, or the prosperity of Cain. For this is not to be understood after the flood, as a Ben Ezra, a Ben Melech, and so they are described in the following words. The same became mighty men for tallness and strength, for power and dominion, for tyrancy and oppression, which were of old, like those that were of old before, or who in after times were spoken of as in the days of old, men of renown or of name, whose names were often made mention of both for their size and their wickedness, they were much talked of and extolled for their exploits and even wicked ones. They were famous men, or rather infamous. For some men get to a name in the world, not for their goodness, but for their greatness, and sometimes for their great wickedness, which sense is countenance by what follows that there were giants in these early times is confirmed by the testimony of many heathen writers, such as the Titans that made war against Saturn, begotten by Uranus, who were not only bulky bodies, but invincible strength. As Apollodorus relates, and Berosus, as B-E-R-O-S-U-S, speaks of a city about Lebanon called Enos 
which was a city of giants who were men of vast bodies and of great strengths, inventors of arms and music, were cannibals and exceedingly debauched. John Gill, Exposition of the Bible, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that it spread throughout the earth, wherever it was, inhabited by men, both among the prosperity of Cain and Seth, and who indeed now were mixed together and become one people. This respects actual transgressions, the wicked actions of men, and those of the grosser sort, which were multiplied, as the word also signifies. They were both great in quality and great in quantity. They were frequently committed, and that everywhere the degeneration was become universal. There was a flood of impiety that spread and covered the whole earth before the deluge of waters came, and which was the cause of it. This God saw not only by his omniscience, by which he sees everything, but he took notice of it in his providence and was displeased with it, and determined in his mind to show his resentment of it and let men see that he observed it and disapproved of it and would punish for it. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The heart of man is evil and wicked, desperately wicked. Yea, wickedness itself, a fountain of iniquity, out of which abundancy of evil flows, by which it may be known in some measure what is in it and how wicked it is. But God that sees it only knows perfectly all the wickedness of it and the evil that is in it. The thoughts of his heart are evil. Evil thoughts are formed in the heart and proceed from it. They are vain, foolish, and sinful, and abominable in the sight of God, by whom they are seen, known, and understood afar off. The imagination of his thoughts is evil, the formation of them, they were evil while forming, the substratum of thought, the very beginning of it, the first notion of it, yea, every such one was evil, and only so, not one good among them, not one good thing in their hearts, not one good thought here, there, not one good imagination of the thought, and so it was continually, from their birth, from their youth upwards, throughout the whole of their lives, and all the days of their lives, night and day, and day after day, without intermission, this respects the original corruption of the heart nature and shows it to be universal. For this was not only true of the men of the old world, but of all mankind. The same is said of men after the flood as before, and of all men in general without any exception. Genesis 8:21. Hence appears the necessity of regeneration and proves that the new creature is not an improvement of the old principles of corrupt nature, since there is no good thing in man, but what is put into him, also the disability of man, to do that which is good, even to think a good thought, or to do a good action. Therefore the works of unregenerate men are not properly good works, since they cannot flow from a right principle, or be directed to a right end. John Gill's Commentary on the Entire Bible, Genesis 6, verse 6. And he repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, because of the wickedness of man, the wickedness of his heart, and the wickedness of his life and conversation, which was so general and increased to such a degree that it was intolerable. Therefore God could have wished, as it were, that he had never made him, since he proved so bad. Not that repentancy, properly speaking, can fall upon God, for he never changes his mind or alters his purposes, though he sometimes changes the course and dispensations of his providency. That is speaking by in anthropopathy, after the manner of men, because God determined to do and did something similar to men when they repented of anything. 
as the potter when he formed a vessel that did not please him and it repents that he has made it he takes it and breaks it in pieces and so God because of man's wickedness to show his aversion to it and repented of his making of it that is he resolved within himself to destroy him as in the next verse which explains this and I grieved him at his heart that is to be understood by the same figure as before for there can no more be any uneasiness in his mind than a change in it for God is a simple being uncompounded and not subject to any passions and affections that is said to observe his great hatred of sin and abhorrency of it. Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, John Gill's Exposition of the Bible. And the Lord said, Not to the angels, nor to Noah, but within himself, on observing to what a height the sin of man had got, and what a spread it made on the earth. I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, though he is my creature, the work of my hands. I have made him out of the earth and made him lord of it. I am now determined to show my detestation of his wickedness and for the honor of my justice to destroy him from off it, just as a potter takes a vessel he dislikes when he has made it and dashes it to pieces, or I will wipe men off of the earth. Like so much dust, man was made of the dust of the earth. He is dust, yea, sinful dust and ashes. And God resolves to send a flood of waters on the earth which should wash off man from it, like so much dust upon it, just as dust is carried off by a flood of waters. See Second Kings chapter 21, verse 13. Or I will blot out man as most renders the words, that is, out of the book of the living. He shall no longer live upon the earth, out of the book of creation, or of the creatures. He shall have no more a being, or be seen among them any more than what is plotted, plotted out of a book, both man and beast, or from man to beast. Even every living creature upon the earth, from man to beast, one as well as another, and one for the sake of the other, the beast for the sake of man, these were made for his use and benefit, but he sinning against God and abusing his mercies, they are to be taken away and destroyed for his sake and as a punishment for his sins. And the creeping things in the fowls of the air, not the creeping things in the great wide sea, for the fishes died not in the deluge, but the creeping things on the earth, Genesis 6, verse 20. For it repented me that I have made them, man, male, and female, whom he created, Adam and Eve, and their prosperity, and particularly the present inhabitants of the earth. But though it may respect man principally, yet it is not to be restrained to them, but takes in all the creatures before mentioned, made for the use of man, and the ends not being answered by them, God repented that he had made them as well as man. Something the repentancy attributed to God in this and the preceding verse is not to be understood of him in himself, but of his spirit in good men, particularly Noah, producing grief, sorrow, and repentancy in him, who wished that man had never been then to be so wicked as he was, but for such a sense that seems to be no matter of foundation in the text. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, John Gill's Exposition of the Bible. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This man and his family were the only exception to the great general apostasy. God always reserves some in the worst of times for himself. There is a remnant according to the election of grace. It was but a small one, and that now appeared, and this was owing to the grace of God and his choice upon that and not to the merits of the creature. This grace, which Noah found and shared in, was the favor and good will of God. Noah was grateful and accepted to him, 
He was well pleased with him in Christ, his person, services, and sacrifices were acceptable to him through the Beloved, though he might not be acceptable in the eyes of men who derided him for his piety and devotion, and especially for his prediction of the flood and making an ark to save him and his family from it. Yet he was very acceptable in the eyes of the Lord and grateful in his sight and was favored with grace from him, who is the God of all grace, and with all the supplies of it, the Jerusalem Targum is, he found grace and mercy. The grace he found was not on account of his own merit, but on account of the mercy of God. And this shows that he was not without sin, or he would have stood in no need of the mercy and grace of God to save him. And as he found grace and favor in things spiritual, so in things temporal, he found favor with God, and therefore he and his family were spared. Now that the whole world of the ungodly were destroyed, he found favor with God, and therefore was directed by him to build an ark for the saving of himself and his. He found favor with him, and therefore, if he had the honor of being the preserver of mankind and the father of a new world. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, John Gill's exposition of the Bible. These are the generations of Noah, or this is the account of his prosperity, of the persons that were generated by him and that sprung from him and peopled the earth after the flood, who are mentioned in the next verse, which that what follows being to be put in a parenthesis, as the genealogy of Adam is carried on from Adam to Noah, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. So the old world ending at the flood, the genealogy of the new world begins with Noah, though Aban Ezra and Ben Gersom interpret the word events. Things which days bring forth. Proverbs 27, verse 1. These are the events or things which befell Noah, of which an account is given in this and some following chapters, whose character is next observed. Noah was a just man, not only before men, but in the sight of God, and not by his own works of righteousness. For no man is just by them before God, but by the righteousness of the promised seed, the Messiah. For he became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Hebrews 11, 7. The righteousness which was to be brought in him by the Son of God, and which was revealed to him from faith to faith, and which by faith he received and lived upon, as every just man does, and believed in as his justifying righteousness before God, though he also lived a holy and righteous conversation before men, which may rather be intended in the next part of his character, and perfect in his generation, not that he was perfectly holy or free from sin, but was a partaker of the true grace of God, was sincere and upright in heart and life, lived an unblemished life and conversation, untainted with the gross corruption of that age he lived in, which he escaped through the knowledge, grace, and fear of God. And therefore it is added that he was wholly upright and blameless in his generations among the men of the several generations he lived, as in the generation before the flood, which was very corrupt indeed, and which corruption was the cause of that, and in the generation after the flood, or in his ages, in the several stages of his life, in youth and in old age, he was throughout the whole course of his life a holy good man. And Noah walked with God, walked according to his will, in the ways of truth and righteousness, walked in a manner well pleasing to him, and enjoyed much communion with him, as Enoch had done before him. Genesis chapter 5 Verse 22. Genesis chapter 6, verse 10. John Gill's exposition of the entire Bible. And Noah begat three sons, Seth, Ham, 
and Japheth. When he was 500 years of age, and before the flood came upon the earth, and when it was so wicked as is next described, of the sons of his, and of the order in which they were placed. See Gil, chapter 5, verse 32. Genesis, chapter 6, verse 11. John Gill's exposition of the entire Bible. The earth also was corrupt before God. That is, the inhabitants of the earth were corrupt in their lives and conversations. They were corrupt both in principle and practice and did abominable things. And those corruptions were, according to Joachim, unclean and idolatry. They were corrupt in the worship of God, worshiping the creature more, or besides the Creator, and they were corrupt in their manners and behaviors to one another, being guilty of fornication and adultery and other erroneous crimes of some against God and of others against their neighbors. And these they committed openly, impudently, without any fear of God or dread of his wrath and displeasure and contempt of him, his will, and laws. And the earth was filled with violence with doing injury to the persons and property of men with opposition and cruelty by tyrannicy decrees and unrighteous judgments or with the rapings and robberies as the Tarkums and Charchi and with his rapes as as Ben Ezra adds the account that Lucian gives from tradition agrees with this and the present race of men is not the first they totally perished by a flood and those men were very insolent and addicted to unjust actions, for they neither kept their oaths, nor were hospitable to strangers, nor gave ear to supplicants, for which reasons they were destroyed. Genesis chapter 6, verse 12. John Gill's Exposition of the Bible. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. This is spoken as if he had never looked upon it before, whereas his eyes are always upon the earth and the inhabitants of it and upon all their ways and works. But this denotes the special notice he took and the particular observation he made upon the condition and circumstances the earth and its inhabitants were in. And this is remarked as well as the particular quote, behold, unquote, is used to denote the certainty of this corruption. It must needs to be true that the earth was corrupted since the omniscience God had declared it to be so, who sees and knows all things. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth, that is, all men, excepting Noah, who were flesh, carnal, and unregenerate persons. These had corrupted the way of God, the true religion, with their idolatries, and they had corrupted their own way, their manners, their life, and conversation with your uncleanliness and wickedness of various sorts. The Arabic writers say that after Enoch was taken away, the children of Seth and Cain worshipped idols, everyone as he pleased, and were immersed in wickedness, and gave their right hands to each other, and joined in fellowship and committing sin and vice, and that in the times of Noah, none were left in the holy mount, but he and his wives and his three sons and their wives all went down below and mixed with the daughters of Cain and were immersed in sins and worshipped strange gods. And so the earth was corrupted and filled with lasciviousness. The Jewish writers also observed that the generations of Cain were guilty of uncleanness, men and women like beasts, and defiled themselves with all kind of fornication and incest, every one with his mother and with his own sister and with his brother's wife, and that openly and in the streets... And Anconio, though, the heathen historian, the writer of the history of Cain's line, says of the fifth generation before the flood that the women of those times without shame lay with any men they could meet with. This is 6.13, John Gill's The Exposition of the Bible. And God said unto Noah, This is a proof that he found favor in his eyes since he spake to him and told him what he had observed and what he was determined to do, and gave him direction to make an ark for the security of himself and family, 
when he should destroy the world. The end of the flesh has come before me, that is, it was determined to put an end to the lives of all men, and of all cattle and fowl and creeping things on the earth, all which are included in the phrase, all flesh, even every living substance on the earth. For the earth is filled with violence through them, that is, through men, for they are principally intended in the preceding clause, though not only, and it was through them and not through other creatures that the earth was filled with violency, in the sense in which it was explained in Segil on Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth, meaning that he would destroy all men together with the cattle and creeping things of the earth, the trees, the herbs, the plants in it, yea, that itself, for that is said to perish by the flood. Second Peter 3, 6. Some render it out of the earth, that is, we destroy them from it, that they should be no more. This is chapter 6, verse 14, John Gill's Exposition of the Bible. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. It is not called a ship, for it was not made for sailing to any distant parts, but an ark or chest being like one flat bottom and rigid and sloping upwards and was made for floating on the waters for a little way. So Lucian and other heathen writers call it a larnax, an ark or chest that was made of gopher wood, which all the targums and the more ancient rabbins stand of cedar wood, some of the box tree as the Arabic version, others the pine, others fir. The Mohammedans say it was from the Indian pine, plane tree and others the turbine tree, but the cypress tree bids fairest to be the wood of which the ark was made. As Fuller, uh, Bachark, and others have shown that being nearest to gopher in sound and being a wood very durable and incorruptible and fit for shipping, Alexander made a navy of cypress trees in the groves and gardens about Babylon. As Strabo relates where this ark was made, it was not easy to say. Some think in Palestine, others uh, near Mount on the borders of India, others in China, but it is most likely it was near the Garden of Eden where Noah lived and not far from Arak, where the ark rested. Boarts conjectures that Gopher is the name of the place where it was made, as well as of the wood of which it was made, and that it might be Prisim or Cyparsim. at C-U-P-R-E-S-S-E-T-U-M or C-Y-P-A-R-I-S-S-O-M, which Drabo places in Assyria. How long Noah was building the ark is variously conjectured. A Jewish writer says 52 years, an Arabic writer 100 years. Others think Noah was building it the whole 120 years, the time of God's long-suffering and forbearance, which some conclude from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. But though it would require not a few years to build such a vessel, and prepare everything necessary for the use of it, yet one would think it should not take so many years as the least account gives unto it. It may be observed the order is, make thou or for thyself, for thy use and benefit, for the saving of thyself and family, as well as for the preservation of the several creatures, which were for the service of him and his prosperity. The brooms shalt thou make in the ark, or in nest, little apartments, and many of them for the several creatures and for their provisions, as well as for Noah and his family. The Targum of Jonathan gives us the number of them, paraphrasing the words thus, 150 cells shall thou make for the ark on the left, and 10 apartments on the, in, in the middle to put food in, and 5 cabins on the right, and 5 on the left. And shall pitch it within and without with pitch. It was pitched without to keep out the waters, that they might more easily slide off and to preserve the ark from being eaten with worms or hide from the wind and sun. And it was pitched within to take off the ill smell that might arise from the several creatures as well as the better security of the ark. Some take it to be a bit human, a sort of clay or slime-like pitch, such as was used in the building of Babel and of the walls of Babylon. Uh, day uh, conjectures it was the kind of bitumen which the Arabs call well, it's K-A-P-H-U-R-A, which agrees in sound with the word here used, but why not the pitch of the pine trees? 
or the rosin of the cypress tree, and especially the latter, if the ark was made of wood of it. Genesis chapter 6, verse 15, John Gill's Exposition of the Bible. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The form and size of it is the length, breadth, and height as follows. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits, which some interpret of geometrical cubits, each of which contains six ordinary cubits, others of sacred cubits, which were larger by a hand's breadth than the common cubic. But the general opinion of the learned men now is that they were common cubics of 18 inches long, and by the geometrical calculations made by them, it is found that the ark of such dimensions was abundantly sufficient to contain Noah and his family and the various creatures and all necessary provisions for them. But if the Jewish and Egyptian cube the cube of the scriptures by Dr. Cumberland has shown it to be consistent of 21 inches and upwards. The ark, according to them, must be very near twice as great and so much more convenient for all the ends to which it was designed. For, as he observes, the cube of such a cubic is very near double the cube of 18 inches. And therefore, so much, so much the capacity be. Noah's Ark was the largest sea-going vessel ever built until the late 19th century, when giant metal ships were first constructed. The Ark was approximately 450 feet by 75 feet, but as late as 1858, the largest vessel of her type in the world was the P&O, liner which was 240 feet by 35 feet the Himalaya. In that year Bruno produced the Great Eastern 692 feet by 83 feet by 30 feet of approximately 19,000 tons five times the tonnage of any ship then afloated. So vast was Bruno's leap that even 40 years later, in an age of fierce competition, the largest liner ever built was still smaller than the Great Eastern. Genesis chapter 6, verse 16, by John Gill, the exposition of the entire Bible. A window shalt thou make to the ark, or a light, such as is that at noon, for which the word in the dual number is used, and thus, Janus, that's J-U-N-I-U-S, and Tremilius, that's T-R-E-M-E-L-L-I-U-S, translated a clear light. The Jewish writers will have it to be a precious stone, a pearl, which Noah fetched from the river Pishon, and high up in the ark, and it gave light to all the creatures, like a large chandelier. But a window, no doubt, it was to let light into the several apartments and to look out at on occasions, since Noah is afterwards said to open it. But what it was made of is difficult to say, since it does not appear that as yet glass was invented. Some think it was made of crystal, which would let in light and keep off the water. A very learned man is of opinion that Noah, understanding chemistry, prepared a fine, subtle, fragrant spirit of an early nature and luminous, which he put into vessels made of crystal or glass and hung them in every room in the ark, and which was both illuminating and refreshing. And this, he thinks, is what is meant by the light, which we translate a window. But this is afterwards said to be opened by Noah to send forth the raven and the dove, which will not agree with such a vessel of spirituous liquor. And in a cubic shalt thou finish it above, 
that the window is some thing which they placed at the top of the ark and supposed to be a cubit in length but the ark itself which was finished with the roof raised up a cubit higher in the middle and the door of the ark shall thou set in the side of it of which it is not said an Arabic writer places it on the east side of it on which side he supposes Noah and his sons dwelt and on the west side his wife and his sons wives how large the story was is not said. It is reasonably supposed to be ten cubits high and eight broad. But there might be room enough for an elephant to enter in by it, and it seems it was so large that Noah and those with him could not shut it. But it was done by the Lord. Genesis seven sixteen. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. The above Arabic writer makes the lower store to be for the beast, the second for the birds, and the third for known as children, and with him agrees a Jewish writer. But as by this distribution, no place is left for provisions. They seem most correct who place the beast in the lower store and the birds of Noah and his family in the uppermost, and the provisions for all in the middle. The ark was a type of church of God. As to the form and pattern of it, it was of God. So the separation of men from the world in a church state is of God. It is by his appointment, and it is his will, that when any numbers of men are converted in a place, that they should be incorporated together in a church state. The form of which is given by him is of officers appointed and the laws and ordinances of it fixed by him. And as to the matter of it, go for wood, a lasting and incorruptible wood, denoting the duration of the church. God ever had and ever will have a church in the world as to the parts of it and rooms of it the rooms may point at particular churches of which there have been many or may signify that there is always room enough in the church of God to receive saints. The ark had three stories in it as the tabernacle and temple had three divisions which were types of the same also. It may have respect to the visible church consisting of believers and unbelievers. The invisible church or general assembly of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, and the church triumphant. The door into the ark may signify Christ who, in faith in him, may be said to be the door into the church and to all the ordinances of it. The window may either typify the glorious light of the gospel held forth in the church or the ordinances of it to which sensible souls betake themselves as doves to the windows. Isaiah 60, verse 8. Into this ark, and not only Noah and his family, but creatures of all sorts were admitted as sinners of all sorts called by grace and become peaceable by receiving to the church of God. Yea, even good and bad have a place here, though the latter under the notion and character of the former, but are hypocrites in Zion. Here also were plenty of provisions for all in it, as there are in the church of God fullness of spiritual provisions for all the people of God. The ark was of the use of a ship and was the means of saving a few men, even Noah and his family. So the church of God has the nature and the use of a ship of which Christ is the pilot and conducts it through the sea of the world in which it is often tossed with tempest and distress but at last brought to its haven, in which a few are saved, not as the cause which alone is Christ, but as the means. The Apostle Peter makes baptism its antitype, 1 Peter 3.21, which is God's ordinancy and not as man's, of his appointing. As to the former manner of it is the object of the role of scorn, when rightly ministered, as Noah's ark was, represents a burial, as that did when Noah entered into it and was an 
emblem of Christ's resurrection and ours. When he came out of it, it was a type of baptism in its flotatory effect. It saves by water, so that does by leading to the resurrection of Christ. It saves not as a cause, but as a means of directing to Christ, the author of salvation, and saves not all in the water, only those that are in the ark, that is, truly and rightly, in the church and real members of it, or that are in Christ, and so many make the ark also a type of Christ. Genesis chapter 6, verse 17, by John Gill. The exposition of the entire Bible. Verse by verse, being read by Dr. Peter John Parises. Genesis 6, verse 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. That there was such a flood of waters brought upon the earth is confirmed by the testimonies of heathen writers of all nations. Only instead of Noah, they put some person of great antiquity in their nation as the Chaldeans, the Grecians, the Romans, etc., Sophesis says all the writers of the barbarians and or heathen histories make mention of the flood or the ark, and he produces the authorities of Berosius the Chaldean, an Egyptian and a physician in antiquity, and many others. They make mention of Milo, who wrote against the Jews, yet speaks of the deluge at which a man and his sons escaped. Abindius. That's A-B-Y-D-E-N-U-S. The Assyrian, whose account agrees with this of Moses, that follows the many things, as do also that of Lucian and Ovid, who, having wrote concerning it, ex- accepting in the names of the person in whose time it was, and only the Egyptians had knowledge of the universal deluge, as appears from the testimony of Plato, who says that an Egyptian priest related to... Uh, Salon, that's S-O-L-O-N, out of their sacred books, the history of it, and from various circumstances in the story of Orissus and Typhoon, which name they give to the seas in the Chaldean language signifies the deluge, and here the t- Targum of Okilos, that's Ankylos, O-N-K-E-L-O-S, renders the word by T U. P-H-A-N-A, and the Arabs to this day call the flood A-L hyphen T-U-F-A-M. But the Chinese also frequently speak of the delusion. Even it is said the Americans of Mexico and Peru had a tradition of it. And the Brahmins, that's B-R-A-M-I-N-E-S, also, who says that 21,000 years ago the sea overwhelmed and drowned the whole earth, excepting one great hill far to the north called B-I-U-D-D, and that there fled thither one woman and seven men, whose name they give. See Genesis chapter 7, verse 13. Those understanding out of their books that such a flood would come, and was then actually coming, prepared against the same and repaired thither. To which place also went two of all sorts of creatures. Genesis 6.19 Herbs, trees, and grass, and everything that had life, to the number in all of 1,800,000 living souls. This flood, they say, lasted 120 years. See Genesis 6.3 Five months and five days, after which time all the creatures that were thus preserved descended down again and replenished the whole earth. But as far for the seven men and woman, only one of them came down with her and dwelt at the foot of the mountain. And this flood was not typical or national only, but general and universal. It was brought upon the earth, upon the whole earth, as the following account shows, by the Lord himself. It was not through second causes or the common course of things, and to show it possible and certain, this form of expression is used. Behold, I, even I do bring. It was wonderful beyond the power of nature, and therefore a, quote, behold, unquote, is prefixed. It was possible, because the Almighty God declares he would bring it, and it was certain, which the redoubling of the word points at, and would be quickly, since he said, I am bringing, or do bring, just about to do it. 
Wherefore the ark was not so long preparing as some have thought, and the command to build it was not long before the flood came. The word of the flood comes from one which signifies to fall, either because the fall of the waters at it, or because it made all things to fall, wither, and decay, as herbs, plants, men, beasts, and all creatures, or from one that signifies to consume, or to mix and confound and bring all things to confusion, as Jarki suggests. And the end and the intention of it, as here expressed, was to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, every living creature, men and women, the beast, the cattle of the earth, and every creeping thing on it, and the fowls of the heaven, man principally, and these for his sake. And everything that is in the earth shall die, but not what was in the waters, the fishes of the sea, which could live in the flood. Genesis chapter 6 verse 18. John Gill's exposition of the entire Bible verse by verse. Being read by Dr. Peter John. Genesis 6.18 But with thee will I establish my covenant. Made with Noah as this time, though not expressed, that on his making an ark, as God directed him, and going into it at his command, he would preserve him while building it from the rage of wicked men, and save him in it and his family when the flood should come, and that they should come safe out of it and repeople the world, which should be no more destroyed by one. For this covenant respects that later mentioned in Genesis 9.11. So Aben Ezra, or the promise of the Messiah, which should spring from him, from the fulfillment of which Noah and his family were spared, and this in every article God would confirm, of which he might be assured from his power, felicity, and faithfulness, and other perfections of his. And thou shalt come into the ark, when the covenant would bring more clearly to be established, and more plainly to be fulfilling, Noah on the one hand being obedient to the divine will, having built an ark and entering into it, and on the other, God giving him leave, and in order to enter into it, and shutting him up in it to preserve him. Thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. That is, Noah and his wife, and his sons and their wives, in all eight people, in eight only, as the Apostle Peter observes in First Peter 3.20. By this it appears that Noah's three sons were married before the flood, but as yet had no children. Jarkin concludes from the mode of expression used that the men and women were to be separate, that they entered the ark in this manner, and continued so, the use of the marriage bed being forbidden them while in the ark. Genesis 6.19 The entire exposition of the Bible by John Gill, verse by verse, being read by Dr. Peter John. Genesis 6.19 And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark that is, of fowls, cattle, and creeping things, as after explained, and two of each sort, at least, were to be brought, as Jarkees observes, and not fewer, though of the clean sort there were to be more, even seven, as after directed, and these were to be brought, that they might preserve their species, at, as it is follows, to keep them alive with thee, to be fed and nourished by him in the ark, while others perished by the flood, that so they might propagate their own species and be continued, for which reason it is further ordered. They shall be male and female, not any two, but one male and one female, for the end before mentioned. Genesis chapter 6, verse 20. John Gill, the exposition of the entire Bible verse by verse. Being read by Dr. Peter John Parises. Genesis chapter 6, verse 20. Of fowls after their kinds, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. What before is generally expressed by every living thing, is here particularly explained of every sort of them. And from the order of them, some have thought that in the same manner they were disposed of in the ark, the fowls in the first story, the cattle in the next, and the creeping things in the lowest most. But others placed them in a different manner. See Gil on Genesis 6.16. The roots and the grains in the lower storage, the living creatures in all sorts in the second, and their hay and litters in the third, 
the second story being 300 cubics long and 50 broad, contained in the whole 15,000 cubics, which is supposed to be divided into 150 equal rooms. So the Targums of Jonathan on Genesis 6.14. Of these four are allowed for Noah and his family, two which with earth before those animals that live underground, one for those which live on herbs and roots, and the other for those that live on flesh, and the other 140 Four rooms are divided in three parts, that is, 24 for birds, 25 for beasts, and the other 95 for such animals as are designed to be food for the rest. And according to the calculations of learned men, they appear to have been in this room sufficient for all sorts, birds, beasts, and creeping things. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. That is, they shall come of themselves, as Joachim and Aben Ezra observed, the providence of God so directing and impelling them, just as the creatures came to Adam, so there was no need for Noah to take any pains by hunting and hawking to get such a number together. The target of Jonathan is, they shall come unto thee by the hand of an angel, who shall take and cause them to come. So says another Jewish writer that they were collected by the angels who presided over each species in which, except for the notion of angels presiding over each kind of species, there is no incongruity as Bishop Patrick observes, and two of every sort were to come in the ark to be preserved alive there, that they might propagate their species. So Lucian says that swine and horses and lions and serpents and all other creatures were on the earth entered into the ark by pairs. Footnote from the reader. My dad, Harry, Walter Dean, used to tell me that the reason we don't have the ark for us to be able to look at and to look into it, which is on Mount Ararat, they have several sightings and pictures of it, is because we humans would take and worship it like an idol, like we have done so many other artifacts that have been discovered. And so therefore, God makes it so that we cannot. Why speculate on how many rooms, how big they were, where the animals were? Noah was not any kind of an expert in any of these things. This would have to be all God-directed. Whether they ate or not during the, uh, the flood, we don't know. We do know that God can cause animals to go into hibernation. We also know that it's foretold that in the future that the lions will eat grass. So God can do whatever he wants. So I don't find any need for this kind of supposing. It's just a waste of words, in my opinion. End of the footnote. Genesis chapter 6, verse 21. John Gill's the entire exposition of the Bible, verse by verse, being read by Dr. Peter John. Genesis six twenty-one, And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, by man and beast, of which we see in Genesis one twenty nine, And thou shalt gather it to thee, to lay up in the ark. And it shall be for food for thee and for them. During the flood, a quantity sufficient for them, and according to the calculation of learned men, well versed in mathematics, there was room enough in the ark, and to spare, and to put food for them all during the time the flood was on the earth. And of Genesis chapter 6, verse 21. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22. John Gill, the exposition of the entire Bible, verse by verse, being read by Dr. Peter John Parises. Genesis 6.22 Thus did Noah, or and, or therefore Noah made, the ark in all things, as the Septuagint and Vulgate Latin versions, according to all God commanded him, so did he. He made the ark according to the pattern God gave him. He gathered together the food for himself and family and for all the creatures and laid it up in the ark as God directed him. And when the time was come, he and they not only entered into it, but he took with him all the creatures he was ordered. As after related, in this we have an instance of his fear of God and his faith in his word and of his obedience to his will. See in Hebrews 11.7, In all which he was a type of Christ, the builder of his church, the ark was a figure of, and the pilot of it through, the tempestuous seas of the world, and the provider of all good things for it, for the substance of it, and of those that were in it. End of Genesis chapter 6, verse 22.
End of Genesis chapter 6.